Chris gave me a bio for Bree. I, I left it somewhere, but I've known Bree for, for uh, pretty much the entire time I've been here uh, in North Carolina for the last uh, dozen years. Um, and uh, she's, it's always a pleasure to have her come speak. Uh, she's won uh, the American Society of Horticultural uh, A-H-S-H, American Society of Horticultural Science. Yeah. I can't remember. Um, one of their awards, which I love, they're the Great American Gardener Awards. It's like the GAG Awards. Um, <laughs> don't, they're not good at the, the acronyms there. Um, and she speaks all over the place. I'm sure many of you follow her on, on various social medias and see her all over the place, see her on TV, uh, uh, growing a greener world and other places. It, she seems to be everywhere. And I gotta say, I've been around other people who are seem to be omnipresent in horticulture out there, um, and a lot of them don't know horticulture, uh, which is why it's so great to see somebody like Bree out there because she really knows what she's doing. She's a fantastic propagator. Um, everything she she talks about, you know, you can go to her house and see her. She's doing it. Um, uh, usually videotaping herself doing it. So, uh, so really, really a deep deep knowledge which is um, which is what you look for in books like she's done gardening with grains and and her previous one foodscape revolution which is amazing as well I can't wait to dig into this book so without further ado I'm going to turn it over to Ray to talk about gardening with grains well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here you guys thank you all for coming I know that it's like the middle of December and the holidays are upon us and you're sharing your time with me to talk about the potentially nerdiest thing you'll ever grow in your garden. <laughs> and I'm sending you all home with action items so no one will escape being crazy grain lady after the end of tonight. <laughs> okay, so do we turn the lights or can mm -hmm. we keep them up? Or? Do you turn them down? Would you like them up? Uh, I, what, I think they probably show up. Is everybody okay with them up? You can turn this one off right over. Oh, maybe that's better. Okay. And can everybody hear me? Yes. I get excited sometimes I shout. So just tell me to quiet down if you need that. Um, you know, Mark said it right. I've been gardening in the Triangle since 2002. So I feel like I am officially a North Carolinian at this stage of the game. I did grow up in southeastern Michigan. Anybody from Michigan? <laughs> yeah, we, we show where we're from from our hands. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in 4-H, and really 4-H is where I got an understanding of horticulture. And so every day I am grateful for the hard work of extension agents who make things like Master Gardeners and 4-H programs and FFA possible because that outreach is extremely important to educate kids so that they'll grow up and be more confident in their ability to keep a plant alive. And we have a serious deficit with that right now in our society. So any of you who are avid gardeners, I really want to encourage you to share your knowledge with literally anyone who will listen to you, okay? Uh, I frequently borrow my neighborhood children. You are going to see a lot of child labor pictures today, so get ready for it. Uh, but that's the thing, kids are excited about this sort of information. And we're definitely at a time where parents don't necessarily garden, so kids aren't learning it the old-fashioned way. So anytime you have the opportunity to share your knowledge or get somebody that's interested in gardening in touch with an extension agent, you know these are critical times that people have a better understanding of how to keep a plant alive and do it with joy. And then become not well-adjusted human beings like me. <laughs> Because it's great, you know, your whole life revolves around growing plants, and it's very, very satisfying. Um, I'm very much inspired by agriculture, and if you couldn't guess by the title of the book, you know, grains, how many of you have ever grown grains in your home landscape? Okay, good, a couple of people. You know, they're not something common. You know, people think about tomatoes or, you know, radishes and, and lettuce and cucumbers, but... We don't really have these agricultural crops as part of our common landscape practice. But there's a lot that goes into growing grains from a farmer's perspective that's beyond just the harvest. There's a component of soil improvement and crop rotation and you know, adding diversity to that planting space. 
And that's something that I think home gardeners don't always pay enough attention to. And so I got into growing grains because I read an article that told me that if I grew out a crop of oats and tilled them in, that would keep the stupid root not nematodes from eating all of my tomatoes. And it's a lie. It totally doesn't work, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> but it was a really amazing first-time experience because, you know, I have this problem with living in the former tobacco field, sandy land of Fuquay, and I'm obsessed with tomatoes. I can't grow tomatoes in the ground anymore at all because of the root knot nematodes. I'm literally willing to try anything, especially if it's an organic method in a crop that I can grow with just a few dollars worth of seed. So a lot of what I'm going to be presenting to you tonight is through the scope of looking at mass agriculture, you know, big uh, non-diverse plots of thousands of acres that are heavily sprayed, and thinking about a world in which we change that agricultural dynamic and how we can then convert that to our home landscape. We have a lot of untapped opportunities in every single residential and commercial landscape that exists. I'm starting to get a little impatient that I'm not seeing better practices put into action already. I've been in this industry now 20 years and we're still planting green meatballs. We have tons of open mulch space and we are obsessed with spraying Roundup. None of those things make any sense from a long-term land management perspective. It's expensive to, land, to manage land the way we currently do. It simply isn't sustainable, both from an environmental perspective, but probably in this society more important from an economic perspective. So we really want people to start thinking more practically not only about the cost of the inputs that you use in your landscape, but think about your time. Think about how you can maximize the joy you get and minimize the work. And I'm going to give you a lot of tips today on how to do that, because until I started growing grains, I gardened the hard way. And now, I actually have way less maintenance in the long run, and my garden is far more beautiful than it ever was before. So we're going to focus on grains because I'm the crazy grain lady, and can you believe that no one else is using that hashtag? <laughs> I really thought it would pick up, but no. If you Google it, you will see everything that I've done for the last what, five years. And that's why hashtags are so handy. Uh, so you can just go on without being on any social media and see from start all the way to now, my entire journey growing grains. So grains are in the Poaceae family, which is the grass family. So that's all your favorite ornamental grasses, that's all the turf grass that we walk on. This is a really easy plant family. It's the most grown plant family in the world, period. There's no ornamental uh, plant family that comes anywhere near uh, what Poaceae plants cover on the face of the earth. So, you know, let's think about how we can be more creative with our application of Poaceous crops. They're wind pollinated. So there's a few advantages and disadvantages to this. Uh, is anybody you know, in touch with the idea that farmers, especially those growing corn, that are growing old varieties or non-GMO varieties, can't harvest the seed because they might have been cross-pollinated from a genetically modified strain? That's because the pollen in the wind can go more than a mile. And that's true of all the grains. And that makes their nomenclature extremely difficult because they are really promiscuous. That pollen flies all over, and you could be growing bronze chief wheat, which is one of the varieties, and soft white wheat. And when you go to harvest that seed to grow the next season, you're really not guaranteed what will be what because the pollen moves around between the plants. They attract wildlife. <laughs> Uh, that's the Golden Panther, a.k.a. Sophia Petrillo, uh, and she is super cute and you need to come visit us and she'll greet you in the driveway, along with Cubby, don't worry, Cubby is still there and he wears a bow tie now. Uh, I say this with quotes because uh, the cats do love to graze on the sprouting, uh, the sprouting leaves of the, all the grain family plants. Uh, but it also will attract other forms of wildlife, good or bad. 
Um, I have a whole chapter devoted to deer in the book. I'm not going to go down that, that road tonight because I will keep you here until midnight if we start talking about mammals. Uh, we can all commiserate together. But uh, the nice thing is it's an opportunity for you to grow some of your own bird seed. And you know how people always say, like, you're never going to get your blueberries because the birds steal them? The same is true of many of your grain crops, um, specifically sorghum. And if you've ever bought bird seed and you've had something germinate that looks like corn, it's actually sorghum. Sorghum is the number one ingredient in all commercial bird seeds. Now, the difference between what you buy at the store and what you grow at home is the lack of pesticides in the seed that you would grow. All bird seed, except what's distributed through Wild Birds Unlimited, is treated with a systemic pesticide so that grubs don't go in or maggots and eat the seed while it's in storage. So if you want to keep your birds from not having exposure to pesticides, you really should start thinking about growing some of your own bird seed. I promise you like $2 worth of seed will feed every cardinal in North Carolina. <laughs> Alright, where do you grow grains? I say this a lot because I talk about vegetables a lot these days, uh, which is ironic considering my obsession with camellias, which do grow in our beautiful <coughs> high pine shade. Have y'all ever seen a farmer tilling in the forest? <laughs> Grains grow in sun. So if you're living in a lot of shade, you might have an opportunity to grow some of the cool season grains, especially if you have deciduous trees, but you're not going to have a lot of success growing anything in dense shade in the Poaceae family. It's really challenging. I mean, just think about how hard it is to keep fescue alive in dense shade. It's going to be the same case with any of these varieties. Um, the nice thing is we have a lot of sunny landscapes and a lot of turf grass available in most of our landscapes, especially in new developments. And one of the other things about new developments, you know, they've gone in with their big equipment and they've you know, mowed down all the trees, and then the soil is heavily compacted so that your house doesn't shift. Well, it's also impossible to dig in, right? And then the landscapers come in, and they don't bring in any soil, and you get the builder basic, and then you try to fix it, and everything you do is that much harder because your ground hasn't been prepared. Well, grains are a really excellent opportunity for improving that hard-packed soil because they have really deep root systems. They also offer a lot of biomass, which can be composted in place, adding organic matter that will break down very quickly. So, we have 40 million acres of turf in the United States. 40 million acres. Do you all think we could do something more interesting than mowing it in straight lines? I grew up mowing three acres of grass every single week, and I loved it. I actually started as a turf grass major when I entered college. Uh, thing is, this is not the best use of our time or our petroleum. Uh, long term, what are we really getting from these manicured spaces of acres and acres, which require so much long term management? So let's think about how we can be creative, especially in commercial developments, thinking about office parks and churches with large lots. How can we convert these spaces to actually be of use for the community while actually improving the environment in which we live? And that's precisely what Chanticleer has set out to do. Now, has anybody visited Chanticleer? If you haven't been, you have to because you're not living a happy life until you've been there. <laughs> I don't say that lightly. Definitely plan for a full day at Chanticleer. It is the world's most inspiring garden. And the former director, Chris Woods, was actually the one that created the serpentine border. And it's, it's uh, designed to mimic a landscape from the 15th century in Tuscany. And of course, Chanticleer is in zone six outside of Philadelphia, so they're not really going to get away with the same plant material. Uh, so in, in, uh, instead of um, Italian cypress, they use Thuya, and then they didn't have the funds, although Chanticleer is well funded, to build a uh, villa. So they made a structure and, and um, created this beautiful arch with uh, espaliered ginkgos which provide really neat seasonal interest. 
And then every season they change the agricultural installation. And so sometimes they do cool season crops. This year, this summer, they actually did Carolina gold rice, as per my suggestion, and it was breathtaking. And then the birds stole all the seed, because I promise you won't get any rice if you grow rice. <laughs> you leave for a day, and the birds will clear you out. So last year, they planted barley. And I was so excited to see it. It was really spectacular. You see, there's a few uh, Reese poppies scattered within. And the whole idea with this installation was to eliminate some of the lawn and give people an opportunity to interact in this agricultural installation, just to get people to have an up close personal experience because most people under 40 have actually never seen wheat in person. They have no idea what how bread is, is started. You know, I talk to eight-year-olds about this, and they're like, oh, my mom doesn't know where bread comes from. You know, and it's a sad reality. And the cool thing with barley is how many of y'all drink beer? Yeah. yeah, I feel like that barley is going to be the gateway to the younger crowd, right? We just need to start hanging out at breweries and giving PowerPoint lectures. And that was what but she had a clear set out to ask. How much beer can we get? from this 2,500 square foot installation. And does anybody have a guess? They got five kegs. It was pretty cool. Five kegs of beer, right? So I said, well, I want to do it. So that's what we did. We put barley into our yard last, last spring. And um, we were able to grow about 800 square foot of barley. And the whole idea was, well, how can I grow something that actually contributes to some of the businesses that are in my community? You know, local breweries are at the heart and soul of the economic development of so many cities across the country. How can we as gardeners actually be a part of that? How can we take that momentum and show people literally where these ingredients come from? Because you don't have beer without barley. So it's really made me a more critical thinker as I've been growing grains because it's made me evaluate my land use very differently than when I did it predominantly growing ornamentals or even as I've been incorporating vegetable crops. You know, those vegetable crops serve their purpose, but you know, they're seasonal and they're gone and they don't have deep root systems and they're not necessarily providing me a lot of organic matter to be able to add back to my soil. The addition of greens has really checked all of those boxes, in addition to looking really beautiful in a season when a lot of other plants still haven't woken up. And so it's been a really great thing. Beyond that, it's also made me a better cook and a much more conscientious consumer. Um, I've had some issues with food allergies for almost 20 years, and what I'm realizing now is literally everyone I know has a food allergy. And there's got to be something to it. We need to have these discussions and really think critically about what we're eating and what, what aspect of that is causing our digestive upset. Why is it that suddenly people can't eat gluten all of a sudden? It's not something that we should just be accepting as the norm. These are standards that we as consumers can help change. So grains are an essential food source globally. I love how in the United States, because we're a very privileged nation, people can just discard carbohydrates because they're like out of style right now. But the bottom line is, grains feed the world, and whether you eat them directly or you eat animals who eat them, nobody on the planet is getting around the grain dynamic. And not all grains have gluten. So even for people who have celiacs, you're still consuming some, uh, some proper cereal grain in your diet. So all of this has led me to really think about what the word local means. Because similar to sustainable and organic, I'm finding that these terms, once they're used for marketing, suddenly lose their value. And you know, I love that there's local breweries, but they're bringing their ingredients from 3,000 miles away. So what's local about it? The water? You know, I mean, let's think about that. How can we actually localize these important things that we're marketing as being special and community-based? And I think this is a really important question that people should start asking. In North Carolina, we're eating almost zero carbohydrates that are state-grown. Bolted Bread is one of the few local companies that sources all of their grains 
from North Carolina farmers. But you know, this is a standard that we should change because local shouldn't just stop with salad greens. You know, I go to one of these fancy you know, restaurants where they're celebrating their commitment to local farms and they serve rice and bread, neither of which came from local sources. But you know, the microgreens did, so that counts. You know, let's really think about this more critically. So some gluten-free grains. Um, I'm mostly going to talk to you all about uh, winter grains or cool season grains tonight because we don't have time to cover it all. A lot of the gluten-free grains are warm season grains. So these are things that you would sow in May and then harvest typically July, August, September, no, uh, October. Um, all of which are very easy and very inexpensive and if you find me this spring I'll have all of these seeds available. And that's really the idea here. In North Carolina, we can grow grains 12 months out of a year. No problem. There's never a month in which you don't have grain, the opportunity to grow a grain. And the nice thing is they're very low maintenance. They don't actually require a tremendous amount of fertilizer when you do your job and build your soil properly. They don't require excessive irrigation. So there's a lot of reasons to grow grains. Maybe they're easier than hosta. <laughs> So you can grow grains as clumps, similar to the way that we grow ornamental grasses. So if anybody's ever bought like a, a pack of, of, say, pink muley grass, you have the option to be able to sow it out and then put it in a container and then plant it that way. Or you could do similar to what the highway department does and do mass scattering of those seeds and let them germinate in place. So you can do the same thing with your grains. And clumps are a really nice way to get started because they look really organized. None of your neighbors are going to question this. <laughs> These grains look just like every other ornamental grass that everybody is used to seeing. The only difference is at the end of the season you can harvest the seed or the birds will steal it. I guarantee once you start growing grains you're going to have more birds than you've ever had before. <laughs> So all you do for this time of year especially, like corn is a little different, sorghum because they grow so much larger, but for wheat, barley, oats, and rye, those cool season crops that you'd be sowing now, I recommend doing a hole that's about three foot wide so that it has a large enough stature. And you're only digging this hole maybe four to six inches deep. I just use a hard rake so you don't even have to bend over. You scatter the seed in the hole and then you cover it back up with soil. You can mulch it at that point, or if you're not into mulching, you can just leave it for the winter. All of these things will germinate at this time of year between 12 and 14 days. You don't have to wait very long. At this time of year, this is the perfect time to be sowing your wheat and barley, which is precisely why I wanted to give you this talk right now, so that you can go home and sow seeds tomorrow. So here are some examples of, of wheat freshly germinated. And then that's what it looks like in the spring as it dries. And then it's easy to harvest at, at that stage, cut it down, and then replace it with a warm season crop. You can also do a mixed meadow approach. And I really like this design. I think this is very effective if you're looking at reducing your amount of turf. You know, you can create a swath like we did in our front yard, or you can make a bed extension and just remove some of your grass and then do this mixed meadow where you really have great biological diversity so that you're not just growing out one monoculture of the grain. You can mix in things like poppies and larkspur and bachelor buttons and nigella. They're all so beautiful. So the best way to do this is first to clear an area and then add quality compost. And I simply can't say enough good things about soil cube. It's literally changed my life as a gardener. Um, I could go on for hours and hours about all the bad soil from local distributors that I've bought over the last 20 years. I'm so grateful that they exist and they deliver and it comes in a waterproof bag. So if you don't get it all put out and it starts to rain, you just cover it up and walk away and all is good. Now what you're going to do is direct seed. You don't need to transplant anything. Transplanting is a waste of your time and energy. It makes the plants weaker because they go through transplant shock. It makes you have to irrigate more and you have to fertilize more. When you direct seed, the plants have an opportunity to establish a deeper taproot system and they will be overall way less maintenance for the long haul. 
Now we often mix our varieties together in a bag and we've sold out of the mixed meadow bags that I put together. Uh, but when you go to sow those, who got them? Right? <laughs> Raise your hand. They're my dream seed packs, by the way. When I was making those last night, I was like, oh, I've waited my whole <laughs> life for these seed packs. <laughs> just shake them up so that all the seeds are well distributed, and then you can just toss them. We call it sprinkling pixie dust, because kids like to do that more than sowing seeds. <laughs> And then typically uh, they'll germinate, at this time of year things germinate really, really fast with zero irrigation. We get plenty of winter through, or plenty of rain through the winter. And uh, because I've been investing so much in my soil for the last few years, I've actually completely stopped fertilizing. Uh, what I do recommend for fertilizer is a simple organic variety like plant tone. You basically can't go wrong with the Espoma line of products. Uh, but, you know, again, the more you invest in your soil, the less fertility that you're going to have to deal with. Um, ground plane coverage is really the most important part of gardening, I think, in general, but especially of this mixed meadow approach, because I don't want you to be out there on your hands and knees weeding chickweed out. I want you to sow this densely so there's no opportunity for anything but the seeds that you sowed to be able to germinate. And that's a really critical part. That's why adding that top dressing of compost will give you a fresh layer of soil that's weed free so that you can sow directly on it. You can then cover that a lightly with mulch. I use triple shred hardwood and I only layer about a half an inch down. We've gone from putting out about 60 yards of mulch a year to about six. I think I ran at six for the year total. That's been a great cost savings, and that's all because of our approach to ground plane management, ground plane coverage. So I want to go over some of the great companions for the winter season. Uh, I think that everybody can garden all summer, but we're really special that we get to garden all winter. And this is Michigan coming out of me because I'm never not going to be excited about seeing the sun in the month of January. Uh, and the fact that we have brilliant blue skies and plants that are like blooming and growing through this cool season makes it that much more special. Though after the traffic I sat in, I think we shouldn't let anybody else move here. <laughs> We're all here, that's what counts, right? <laughs> So, sow these now. We're a little bit past my main target date. I generally recommend that you stay home on Black Friday and sow your seeds because that is a much better use of your time than buying garbage uh, and getting trampled at stores. Uh, but these can still be sown now. I usually try to have all my winter stuff sown by the 15th of January. That way you will be ensured that it will germinate and it will bloom before we get really hot because these cool crops don't like temperatures over 90 degrees. And last year, we were like, what, 101, the 22nd of May. So, you know, we ha you have to take advantage of this cool season knowing that summer sneaks up on us much, much earlier than we wish it would. So carrots are a must-have, and uh, we do eat a lot of carrots that we grow, but I probably scatter like 2 million carrot seeds a year, and we don't eat 2 million carrots. Uh, I grow them primarily to let them flower. I think they're beautiful, and I like to let the uh, swallowtail caterpillars eat the foliage. It's a really important food source during the off-season in May and June before uh, a lot of the other plants like uh, dill and, and fennel and things are really growing actively. Larkspur. How many of you love seeing deer eat everything in your yard? <laughs> then you need to grow larkspur because larkspur is poisonous and it's beautiful. And if you plant enough of it, the deer will literally bypass your yard and go to your neighbors. <laughs> it's probably the best advice I can provide. There are lots of different strategies for planting to deter browsing mammals, but something like larkspur, especially for winter browsers, is extremely effective. And the great thing is when you mix this with your wheat, that will deter them from eating all of your, your ripe wheat seed because they will, trust me, they love wheat just as much as we do. Deer are carboholics. <laughs> poppies, um, I, I love all poppies, but Papaver somniferum is the variety that I have the most success with. And when you have it in well-enriched soil, it can easily grow as tall as me. 
Um, they will self-sow, but they require light to germinate. So you cannot cover your poppy seeds. When you sow them, they're the last thing you put down. Don't walk on the bed. Don't put mulch back over it. Let them germinate in place. They do not transplant because they have a taproot. Neither does Larkspur. They have to be direct planted. Uh, but the poppies can't be covered. And so a lot of times people say their poppies don't self-sow. It's likely because of their mulching regimen. So you'll find that they often come up like in cracks or right along edges where you're not constantly messing with your soil. And that's why. Nigella, love in the mist. I love this. It's shorter than all the rest. And so it's really nice to put closer to the front of your border. And it's a wonderful cut flower. And you can also eat the seed. It's uh, what, like Asian caraway, I think is sometimes what Black it's referred sesame. to. Pardon? Black sesame. Black sesame, yeah. So it's a beautiful plant. Tends to start flowering right around Mother's Day. So it has a lot of folklore with appreciating moms. Now, I talked a little bit about soil improvement, but this has really become the most important part of why I grow grains. My initial thing was I was obsessed with wanting to eat my own carbohydrates. I've kind of gotten over it because it's a lot of work. Don't worry, I'll share. Uh, soil improvement is my number one focus. And each year that I grow greens, my soil improves significantly. So the nice thing is, all that biomass, after you've gone through and harvested the seeds, if you're interested in harvesting for the purpose of consumption, you just mow those stalks in place. How many of you in your lifetime have ever bought a bale of wheat straw? You can literally grow your own wheat straw. It's just the stalk of wheat plants. Yeah, it was like a huge moment for me when I realized that. You know, like, oh, 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 this is actually really useful. Oh, maybe, maybe grades aren't as, aren't as odd to have. Now, all that shredded organic matter will break down typically in the summer when you're doing this with wheat. This is um, usually mid-June in our climate. Because our temperatures are so hot, this stuff tends to break down in closer to 25 days. If we have a cooler month, it might take a few more weeks. Nevertheless, you can seed directly into this and then lightly mulch so that it looks tidy and none of your neighbors get offended. But this is the most effective way to build up your soil. And what you're doing is you're leaving all those roots in place. These are annual plants. They are not going to re-sprout. Once they have gone to seed and dried out, they're dead. Okay? We're too hot in the summer for these particular cool season crops to germinate and grow again because they don't tolerate temperatures in the mid-90s for you know 90 days at a time. So you don't have to worry about them being invasive seeders. So even if you're not harvesting the seed, you can mow all of that biomass back down in place. All of that will break down, adding important organic matter and making it so you don't haul anything to a compost pile. Because I promise you, having a 13-year-old boy <laughs> mow this down for you and you watch while you drink sangria is a much better use of your time. <laughs> He's going to be for hire soon, you know. <laughs> And so that's the goal. This is a, a shot from our neighbor's roof of basically how we have it set up. You see big, big blocks of larkspur, uh, you know, a big area of wheat through here. All of the open mulch space is covered, so there's not an opportunity for problem plants to develop. So this is what you need to sow right now, or like in the next few weeks. I'll give you, you know, until mid-January. Mid, mid that's your end date. You know, you want to have this wrapped up. Uh, lots of different vegetables, all of which are, you know, delicious to eat, but look really nice for winter interest. Um, all the different flowers, and then, of course, your four cool season grains. I'm glad that people are taking pictures of slides. <laughs> so here are your cool season grains that I want to get into some of the specifics. And it's just really important to recognize they're frost tolerant. They like cold weather. They don't like heat, so they can't be grown in the summertime. Um, and so you're sowing them, say, November, December. You're harvesting after Memorial Day when they dry out. I find that I'm usually harvesting my grains between the 10th and the 21st of June. I try to have my summer plants uh, all planted in the ground before the 4th of July. 
Now, I know this is a different cycle than what most people do because a lot of people get really excited in April and they put their warm season crops out. And then the plants look terrible by August and we still have three more months of summer left. So what I realized is I can delay my summer plantings and extend my cool season plantings and have plants that look better for a much longer duration of time and I don't have to irrigate as much and you know I, I can take joy and go outside and take pictures instead of you know working hard in, in the hot summer sun. Yeah. Can you go back to that last slide? Oh yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> more more cameras. <laughs> That's awesome. And by the way, you can email me and I'll send you the whole slideshow. And compressed, it might email easier. No, it won't. Okay. I learned some technology stuff tonight about compressing files. Which I've never done. <laughs> so let's get into, we're going to highlight three cool season crops. And uh, first is barley. And barley is really, really an incredible plant to grow. I call it the beauty queen. Is It's absolutely the strongest grower. And it has these long awns, which look like cat's whiskers. And when the sun shines through it, it's just magnificent. And you find yourself like falling to your knees and taking 100,000 photos. Or maybe that's just me. But <laughs> um, barley does equal beer. Um, now, there are some gluten-free beers. Uh, but beer really is made from hops and barley. You're not really getting around that. So we don't have a great climate in central North Carolina for hops production. That's better in the mountains where the temperatures are cooler in the summer. But we have a fabulous climate for growing barley in the winter. And there's really no reason that small batch farmers can't be doing this as a means of connecting to this local food movement or local, local beer movement. But there's also a lot of reasons for all of us who consume beer to grow some of these ingredients just so we have a better understanding of what we're drinking, what went into making that beverage possible. So there's some really fun facts about barley. And I had a lot of fun researching these crops, things that I never would have known. But did anybody know like what your shoe size was from? Because it's not inches, it's not hmm. centimeters, right? It dates back to the 1500s, when barley corn was the standard for measurement, size, and was, was money. And so the term, eat your savings, literally goes back to when barley was the denomination of money. It was terrible because it attracts all kinds of varmints. There's a whole chapter on that too, y'all. Don't bring grains and leave them in your attic unless you want to have animals come visit you. Uh, but yeah, your shoe size. I wear a size seven. That seven barley seeds put together equals my shoe size. <laughs> so yeah, fun fact, you can share that now with everyone. <laughs> I have yet to meet someone who actually understands what, our, what American and British shoe sizes are based off of. So moving into oats. This is a plant that I think most people are familiar with the cosmetic brand of Vina. And, you know, they didn't have to get very creative with their name. They're one of their base ingredients is oats. And, well, Avena is the botanical name of oats. So that should be easy for you all to remember. Now, I call oats the dancer. Oats are the tallest of the grains for the cool season, typically growing five, sometimes six foot tall. And as their seed ripens, they really dance in the wind. They're just magnificent. The birds will eat them faster than you can blink your eyes. I never get enough oats to be able to harvest, to be able to have meaningful amounts to cook with because the birds beat me every single year. Mm -hmm. But I'm always determined to try. Now they have really amazing foliage. It's really kind of a blue-gray. It's quite wide. So this is, you know, checks off all those ornamental grass boxes that people want to fill. It's just, most of the ornamental grasses that we grow are warm season. So they're dormant in the winter. So they're brown or worse, people cut them down you know, in the fall and eliminate that habitat for native pollinators. These you can use in the same way, but they grow all winter. So it's just a really nice thing to be able to accent in your landscape. Now, oats have the deepest root system. And there's a lot of really interesting things going on 
um, and the University of Minnesota working to perennialize a lot of these grain crops for their carbon sequestering capacity. A perennial oat has a root system that exceeds eight foot deep. Does an incredible job of capturing carbon, putting it back down into the earth to help long term with climate change issues. So all of these grains have a major potential to be able to change the way our world uh, you know, is developed and, and our commercial agriculture systems. But if you have a new house and you have crappy soil, sow some oats, sow them tomorrow. I promise you by June your soil will be fixed. 36 inches deep these roots go and they act as natural rototillers. When you then mow that biomass back in place and let it decompose, you have a beautiful layer of topsoil. This is why Michigan and Iowa and Indiana are so easy to grow plants in, you know, because they have this amazing topsoil that's been created with years and years of bio, uh, biomass. Now, sow your wild oats, you know, is a pretty common statement about regretting, making a regret, doing something you regret. Well, it turns out that it was that, quite literally, with regard to sowing a crop that you don't like. So I say this at the Foodscaping Talk a lot, but grow the plants you like to eat, and if you don't like to eat them, you know, like if you don't like Swiss chard, don't grow 100 plants of it. Grow the plants that are practical for you, and that is the same case in, in what Sow Your Wild Oats really refers to. Be practical. All right, getting into wheat. Wheat was the first thing that I grew. Uh, my first variety was a modern variety from uh, University of North Dakota called Glen. And it was like maybe my most successful horticulture endeavor ever, which is what captured my attention and got me devoted to grains. Uh, it's a workhorse. Wheat is, you know, tolerant to zero degrees easily, actually it goes way below. All these grains can go much, much colder than what our climate offers. But wheat also has a very deep root system, typically 30 to 36 inches deep. So it's another really important tiller. Um, it's the most grown crop on the planet, and it's grown on every continent except Antarctica. And for all the haters, you know, Here's the thing, wheat provides 13% of vegetable protein uh, that people consume globally. So it's a really important staple, whether it's in fashion right now or not. Uh, the likelihood of wheat being eliminated from the human diet is basically zero. Uh, and, and so, you know, perhaps what we need to really be considering is how we grow the wheat, you know, our cultural standards for commercial agriculture, and how all of us as consumers can play a role in changing that trajectory. We all have to just realize that we vote with our money. And when you buy substandard products, then it's accepted as being okay. And when you start making changes, other changes will occur. So, varieties and sources. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, <laughs> type in grain seed on Google. <laughs> You'll discover an entire world that I had no idea really existed. Baker Creek is where I started. They are always a reliable source. Their seed always germinates. I love their website. It's extremely easy to maneuver. And their catalog is quite possibly the most amazing book that gets printed every single year. Uh, Baker Creek is, I think, to me, they're on the leading edge of being relevant in vegetables and offering the public an opportunity to grow something interesting. Um, now you have a couple things with, with, uh, with wheat specifically to start making decisions on your variety selection. You have onless varieties, meaning they don't have the whiskers, which is really practical when you're harvesting for the purpose of consuming because you have less stuff to get rid of. But if you're growing these just because you think they're pretty, uh, I like the on varieties, and in my hand there is out of like a thousand seed, I had five plants of black eagle that actually produced black ons. Uh, so sometimes those black varieties aren't as reliable as I wish they were, but it's still something I covet. Now, there's a lot of discussion about ancient versus modern, and there's a lot of misunderstandings in this world about genetic modifications. 
Uh, I really spell this out. I have a whole chapter devoted to this in the book. I've done a lot of research and I worked very closely with Dr. Tom Rainey to make sure that all my chromosome information is accurate. Uh, the thing is, we're not always well informed when we make decisions that are very emotional. It's very easy for us to say genetic modifications are bad because of Roundup. Well, there's millions of genetic modifications that have nothing at all to do with herbicide resistance. You know, most modifications revolve around higher yield, disease resistance, insect resistance, better nutrient density, better capacity to hold up for uh, machinery being harvested, like harvesting with machinery. So, you know, herbicide is only one tiny part of the whole vision of genetic modifications. And it's really a disservice to the science community and to the thousands of years of modifications that were considered safe because they were done traditionally, when now geneticists are simply using tools to be more efficient in the way they gene edit. So please, before you make an assumption, do your research. Uh, it's, it's really important that we all have more intelligent conversations about these hot topics. Um, these breeders aren't going to work every day with the plan of poisoning the general population. You know, what they're trying to do is feed a global population that demands food at a cheaper price than it's ever been before. And we all expect that. We all expect that grocery stores are going to have everything that we want any day of the year, 24 hours a day. And with that comes efficiencies. And genetic modifications are simply one tool in the agricultural uh, component to make food available to all of us. So getting into ancient grains, um, there's a lot of confusion about this. Uh, again, it's a problem when words like ancient or heirloom start to get used for marketing purposes because then they lose their meaning. And we're totally at that stage now where you could buy something at Trader Joe's that says ancient grains and it's $4 more than the thing sitting next to it. And technically they're the same and really all grains are ancient. They all date back somewhere around 10,000 years. You know, like these, these grains have been around a real long time. So most of the time, people are talking about wheat when they're talking about ancient grains. And so there's some varieties, specifically einkorn and emmer, which do grow really, really well here in central North Carolina. Although I'll tell you, they lack structural integrity. So uh, I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, other ancient varieties include barley and millet, all these other oat sorghum, but then pseudo cereals, so plants that aren't in the Poaceae family, so they're not cereal grains, are lumped into this ancient grain category. So that's where you get amaranth, buckwheat, quinoa, and chia, all of which are pseudo cereals, so they already have different growing systems. And they are actually not wind pollinated, and you know, there's lots of differentials between these pseudo cereals and the poaceous plants. Now, stem strength matters a lot, and it's not just for combines. You know, I, my first crop was a modern variety, not a single plant bent over. We had lots of rain, lots of wind that spring, everything was beautiful. The next year, I decided to be more authentic, and I wanted to only do ancient varieties. And it cost me a whole lot more, I'll definitely confess that, because I was buying really small seed packets at the time. And uh, we got very cold, a lot of the ancient varieties weren't hardened off, and they actually died when we got down to like 14 degrees, which shouldn't impact cool crops. The ones that did make it, as they grew, and we had a strong storm in April, every plant lodged over. It was very stressful because we were uh, having a photo shoot for the grains that spring, and I really got an earful from the author about why the grains weren't standing upright. And that's when I first realized the importance of modifications to improve a crop, whether it's you know using biotechnology or you know traditional breeding practices. Stem strength is really important if you want to have a harvestable crop. And that was one of my biggest challenges with the old varieties, 
And that's why I really grow those ancient cultivars now either in containers or in much smaller plots because it's just not worth the square footage to have all of it flop over. Um, now, cultural practices. This is something that when we are so far removed from our food sources, it's really difficult to ask these questions. And that's why supporting local farmers and going to the local farmer's market is so important because you can connect to the people who are actually growing the food that you eat. But, you know, looking first at soil, are they developing the soil? Or are we living, you know, off of plants that are entirely synthetically fed, which eliminates the microbial activity, which then puts the plant in a position to be, you know, more, more, uh, cap more or less resistant to disease, which then puts it in a place of having more likelihood of having a problem insect. Well, you add disease often, which then you have a treatment of a fungicide. Uh, you have pest problems, then you have, you know, pesticides then being added. And then to add on top of that is this new practice, which has really only been in for maybe 15 years, where farmers are now, uh, because their land needs to be turned faster, uh, because of our standards with, you know, what our crops cost and what they're valued at, are spraying with persistent herbicides. And this might actually be at the heart of a lot of what people are calling gluten intolerances. Not celiac disease at all, but for people who have problems digesting, um, you know, specifically wheat crops, it might be more related to this persistent herbicide that's being sprayed to make the crops uh, able to be harvested more efficiently. Again, farmers are constantly having to balance you know, making a living and turning their land efficiently, uh, you know, with our standards for what we're willing to buy. And again, this is a topic that we don't have a lot of information on. Our, our society isn't necessarily invested a lot in getting to the bottom of understanding, you know, why, why can't I eat wheat pasta anymore? Is that something I just accept or is it something that I try to figure out and solve? So we did an entire episode on persistent herbicides in grains with Growing a Greener World. Um, this is one of the reasons that I love using soil cubes so much because I know what goes into their compost and the hay that they use has not been treated with a persistent herbicide. It's been allowed to dry naturally in the field and that's the same hay that the cows eat that's the manure that goes into the soil cube compost. So if you get say horse manure or cow manure that ate, that ate wheat straw that was treated with a persistent herbicide, the herbicide doesn't go away in their digestive system and it's actually active for five years after it's been composted. So if you put that compost into your garden, what you're going to get is the result that looks like you've sprayed everything with Roundup. Your seeds will come up mutilated and you know, that's the problem. That's what killer compost is. And it's really challenging to get this information, especially when you're buying pre-bagged compost. Now, in our front yard, um, we, were, we grew 800 square feet, and the big challenge was figuring out how much flour we would get from that. And we got 20 pounds of flour. And another thing we learned is that having parties where you serve cocktails and rely on adults to harvest is not efficient. <laughs> uh, you definitely should have the junior master gardeners come to your house and do the harvesting for you. Kids are the perfect size and they have the right energy level. Uh, and you don't have to give them gin and tonics. <laughs> you should not. But that, that first year when we grew that wheat, I really started to think about because, you know, we have about 100 houses in our neighborhood and everybody has an acre of full sun turf. Full sun turf. Everybody mows all that lawn every single week. Everybody sprays that lawn when it grows out of its bounds. How could we do something more with all of this space that nobody's really utilizing? I'm not saying eliminate your grass. I'm just saying, you know, 800 square feet in every yard. If everybody in my neighborhood did that, we grow 2,000 pounds of flour for a local bakery that's organic and local. We could grow gluten-free grains to be able to supply better quality for people who have celiacs. We could have interactions that our landscapes make a difference at that local brewery that we like to go to. 
You know, and that's the thing. I like to dream big, and I like to think that there's more that we could do because we have definitely not reached our greatest potential in the American landscape. Now, hand harvesting just the seed head. And you see, this is where kids are really in handy. And if you get them, as they grow up, they'll invite their friends to come over. And that's very, that's really the bonus there. And so we're leaving the stalks in place because the stalks, to me, are the most valuable part of the grain. So all we're doing is in a, they just break right off. You don't need clippers or anything. You just de-head the grain, leave that in, in there. You put the whole grain into a bucket. David made this thresher based off of a YouTube video. Um, we have plenty of YouTube videos showing exactly how to make this, and it's all detailed in the book. But you see, it's not anything that's like terribly unusual, a drill, a bucket, a box fan. None of this stuff is, you know, all that out of the ordinary. Then you winnow it. The threshing process is just beating, just beating the crap out of it. That's, that's what your goal is there. And then you, you just winnow. You use that fan. You blow the chafe away. It's wonderful mulch, so don't waste it. Station yourself in an area of your garden where you can really use all that biomass. And that's what it looks like mid-thresh. And you could feed that to chickens, but I don't recommend cooking with it at that stage. Uh, it's very high in fiber. <laughs> Maybe your doctors would recommend that, you know. <laughs> now, after about three winnowings, usually three or four winnowings, that's when you get to clean seed that's ready to be uh, ground. And um, our first, our first uh, grinder because we were really doing things like the hardest way possible. <laughs> um, we got a hand crank grinder, because that's really fun. And you should be able to eat all the carbs in the world if you're going to grind them yourself. Uh, we ended up getting a lot ground, because we did this on 4th of July. And when the neighborhood men came over, we timed them, and that motivated them to work really hard. <laughs> and, and yeah, we ended up getting 20 pounds of flour out of that experiment. Uh, the two-year-old maybe wasn't the, the best grinder on the, on the staff that year. We moved on to a KitchenAid attachment grinder, and this is really great for small batches of flour. It's, it's pretty fast. It's loud, all the grinders are. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily do this for like the amount of cookies that we made today because that is a lot of time spent with your KitchenAid. Instead, if you're really wanting to grind your own flour, get the Wonder Mill. Mm. It's truly a wonder. It's, I don't think there's been a product named better than this, more accurately. <laughs> um, this will do two cups of raw seed into, there's, are there three settings? Was it bread, pastry? I think there was only two settings on it. I don't know. There's two or three settings on it. So you can get different, um, different textures depending on what you're trying to bake with. Uh, but it'll do that in about 32 seconds. So it's really fast. Follow the directions. If you get this, you have to plug it in and turn it on with nothing in it. And it sounds, it doesn't sound like a helicopter. <laughs> a shop vac. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like a shop vac. Now, homegrown is whole grain. And when we really get down to talking about, you know, our carbs good, our, our cereal, something that should be in your diet, the less refined, the better they are for you. So, sorry, yeah, bleached white flour doesn't really have anything good in it. It certainly tastes good, right? Uh, but the ones that you grow and grind at home do have a different texture. I mean, you can see the difference between, you know, what we ground in the Wonder Mill versus King Arthur bread flour. Um, that's the, the turkey, uh, hard turkey red ground by hand. So you see the difference between the hand grinder and, um, and this is another, this is another hand ground. Oh, that was a different hand, hand grinder. We had three hand, hand grinders at one time. We've, we've, we've given those new homes. <laughs> now the nice thing when you do get to grow and cook from your own grains is that you do know that they are nutrient dense and they're delicious. And so tonight we have two cookies that are in the recipe chapter. And this is the, the sorghum spice, and it's very appropriate for the holiday season. And then we also have the oatmeal chocolate chip cookies, which are our favorite of my helper, Abby. But we have 13 recipes in the book 
from the help of my amazing friend, Chef Justin Dillery, who's right here. <laughs> and he's here to answer all your cooking questions. And I also want to give a shout out to Preston Montague for the beautiful botanical illustrations that are throughout the book. And he also designed a special greeting card that is part of the book uh, package that we're selling tonight. You get one book, one card, two packs of seed for $30 because I can't do math. <laughs> now, I have to, before I wrap up, I have a container challenge for all of you because I like to send everybody home with action items, okay? So, you can get seed from me, and I want you to think about a container that you have laying around that you don't have planted for the winter. All you have to do, now I fill all my pots with soil cube, I don't buy any, any normal potting soil anymore. Soil cube works perfectly, and basically for the winter I don't even have to water these pots, because the soil cube is denser than normal potting soil, so it holds more moisture and eliminates my need for irrigating. All you do, you scatter one packet of seed per pot, okay? One packet per pot. And then you can cover it lightly with soil or you can lightly mulch it. It will grow <laughs> typically within two weeks. So there it is, the day it was planted. This was literally 14 days later. And you'll have winter interest. So I took this picture like three days ago. Um, that is barley, by the way, growing in the back of that. And I, I paired it with Carex from Hoffman Nursery. <laughs> and I actually think I added some garlic because why shouldn't you grow garlic? We all eat it. You should grow it. So everything you need comes with this. You get a bag of soil cube. You can get the, the book and the seeds. And then you have a pot that you can plant. My main request from you all tonight is if you'll please consider giving me an Amazon review. <laughs> because apparently that's the most important thing in publishing in 2019. <laughs> uh, it's relatively easy if you just go to Amazon Gardening the Greens, it pops right up. And I do very much appreciate their capacity uh, to follow up on, on shipping orders very quickly. They're faster than I am. So I want to thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And I just wish you all the best this holiday season. And I hope that you will be as inspired to grow grains as I am. I think that you'll all find that they are easy and they will open your eyes to lots of new possibilities. And I would love to invite you all to come visit us. Uh, we're tentatively planning to have a grain open house uh, the second Saturday of May. So that's the Saturday before Mother's Day. And uh, you can go to my website, breegrows.com, and I'll post more updates about that. And in the meantime, you can follow me on all my social channels. And if you're inclined to watch videos, I'm really trying to up my video game on YouTube. So <laughs> give me a follow there. And then if you're good at making videos, will you please come and help me? <laughs> Thank you all. And if you have questions, you can find me over here at the table. Thank you.